if you've been diving that much into it. Uh, but before we sing this next song, uh, I wanted to look at a little bit of the concept of hope and hope for the future. Because the next song is about this relationship between Good Friday and Resurrection Sunday or Easter. And why is it that we call it Good Friday? Well, I want to read from 1 Corinthians 15, starting in verse 12. And it says this, but if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God. For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if, in fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But then there's a big transition moment in this. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. And as we think about this relationship between Good Friday and Resurrection Sunday, it highlights this distinction. That Good Friday was this day originally of hopelessness, that you know, Christ isn't being raised from the dead, that death finally has has caught up to him, and that all of his teachings, all of his miracles, well, I guess they had to end sometime. But instead, because of the power of the Spirit and the power of God, Jesus was raised again on that, was that day three days later, and that we have hope because of that. And that just as this, we're about to sing in the song, the words that Friday is good because Sunday is coming. And we have hope for this life because we know that just as God has raised Christ from the dead, that we will be raised again and will live with him for eternity as well. Let's stand as we're about to sing this next song. Take him in as his 
Grim betrayed him with a kiss. And there before the mocking crowd, like a lamb to the slaughter, didn't make a sound. Then he carried that cross to Calvary. Shed his blood to set us free. As the nails went in and the sky went dark, oh, the redemption of the world was on his heart. Friday's good, cause Sunday's coming. Don't lose hope, cause Sunday's coming. Good morning, church. It's 
great to see everybody here today. And uh, if you're new with us, we do partake of the emblems as one body of believers. And if you didn't get a chance to pick those up, they are in the back of the church and you'll have a little bit of time to get them. I remember Lee Bracey gave a sermon and the sermon was don't put God in a box because he's capable of doing things that uh, you can't even imagine. And uh, about three weeks ago, we as a leadership of the church here took a very, very bold step and we gave $7,000 back to the congregation to give as a missions outreach to our community in a way that you felt needed. You know, and uh, we started asking for some of those stories to come back in and uh, they're starting to trickle in. And I've had some people come up to me face to face and tell me, and I, when I look at them, they don't need to tell me the story. I can see the love and the joy on their face when they tell the experience they had giving them away. But uh, this morning, there's a special one I'd like to share because I think it's so fitting for communion. Now I'm gonna leave some parts out of this just so uh, I don't embarrass anybody, but uh, this is one we got back in. We have chosen to take our missions outreach and give it to a young lady in need. We know the parents better than her, but she's had some hard time with some poor choices recently. We took the money and added to it to help her. The message sent was, we didn't care about what poor decisions you've made in the past. The church wants to help support you in the future. Given with no strings, just the love that was entrusted to us. We have planted a seed. That is what it's about. When we come here to church on Sunday morning, and we've given our life to Jesus Christ. He doesn't care about our past. He's forgiven us for that. What he's interested is our future and today, and we're going. And I think that is so fitting with communion. You know, and when I, every time I do communion, I sit here in church, either when I'm presenting communion to you or as myself, I just hold these emblems in my hand, and I just have to say, thank you. Thank you, Jesus for saving me. Thank you, Jesus, for getting about my past. Thank you, Jesus, for giving me a church and the people, a community to go forward. And it's beyond this church, the people that have helped me. So that's what I challenge you to do this morning. You know, as we take communion this morning as one body of believers, look at those emblems that are in our hands and know that you've been forgiven. And Jesus paid the ultimate price, and he did it willingly for us with his love. Let's go to prayer. Father God, you've just given us so much, so much to be grateful for. And you know, as we gather as a group of leaders here at the church, we just pray that uh, you take the simple gift that we're going to present back to you, send it out in the community, and just glorify you and multiply that love, Lord, to reach that one person that's so desperately seeking hope. And we pray this in your son's precious and holy name. Amen. And this is from the book of Mark. Why are they reading? Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, take this. This is my body. Let us do likewise. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, do this likewise. Let us partake.
Now we'll go ahead and pray over our offering. The offering stations are in the back of the church, and we do have a way you can give online. Father God, you've given us so much of the church. And Lord, I just pray now as we partake of this offering that uh, we get ready to present to you, Lord. Help us to give with a giving and gracious heart. Help us as church that uh, we reach that world that's so desperately hurting. And Lord, I just uh, pray that um, we can be a beacon of hope to all those that are in need. We pray this in your son's precious and holy name. Amen. Um, Roger came up to me and said, we need cookies. Uh, Vacation Bible School is rapidly approaching. There's a sign-up sheet out there. They would like to have 18 dozen cookies per night. I said, that's a lot of cookies, Roger. He said, i got to take care of everybody. So uh, anyway, if you want to sign up out there, they've got one day supply signed up for us so far. Uh, got a few more to go there. So if you can sign up before you leave today, they would... Uh, Greatly appreciate that. Also, I have a thank you note here um, I want to share with you. Uh, thank you, Pleasant View Church of Christ, for all your prayers, visits, and cards during the last few weeks of Jim's recovery from the broken hip. He's progressing nicely. He's coming home Friday afternoon. He is home. We look forward to seeing you soon, uh, Jim and Ellie Wilson. Also, a couple weeks ago when I preached, I used that prayer from Bob Russell. Uh, some of you mentioned you would like to have a copy of that. Uh, I've made copies of it, and they're on the table uh, underneath the bulletin board area next to the collection box for Trine University Campus House. And you also know in the bulletin, uh, there's a sign-up sheet there, or not a sign-up sheet, but some listed items that we need to get for the Campus House to help, a lot going on right now, uh, to help them out. And then also all of the gift card names for Christmas in July for Woodburn Christian Children's Home have been taken, but... If you did not get a name and you still want to get a $25 gift card to Meyer or Walmart, um, Joe Hines said we can always use the gift cards. So uh, if you didn't get a name and you'd like to still get one, you can just pick up the card. And there's a basket out there by the Christmas tree. You can put it in. So like I said, a lot of collection things going on. And I think next week uh, the fish banks will be out um, for the collection for eyes as we get ready for the food packing. Uh, that's going to be coming up. Like I said, the next six weeks is really going to be busy. Uh, a lot of things going on. I would encourage you to simply um, get plugged in uh, to those things that, um, that you can help out in and you'd want to help out in. Okay, appreciate Matthew sharing last week. I watched the sermon online and thought, man, he's doing a really good job. And then it happened. I said, Matthew, how come every time I've gone, somebody has to make fun of how old I am? You remember he mentioned he spends more time with Stephen because Stephen's only, what, eight years older? And he said, not so much with Michael because he's 52 years older. So no matter what, I can't get away from being made fun. So uh, Matthew was doing a phenomenal job up to then. After that, no, it was good. It was a good sermon. I appreciate watching and listen, <laughs> listening to it. Okay, we're going to deal with that, something that I just hear a lot of. What, 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 what does God want me to do? What's God's will for my life? How can I tell if this is God's will or my will? What, what was your definition of that? Oh, Jeff, look at me. What was your definition of God's will and, and your will? What did you tell me earlier? Okay, yeah, he knows, knows what his will is, but not God's will. That's a good definition. We ought to put that in there. Um, I don't think it's that hard to figure out. I, I believe if you look at Scripture, it's very easily uh, defined for us. And Paul, talking to Timothy, just put in plain old English what God's will is, what he wants us to do. So we're going to look at 2 Timothy chapter 2, the first 10 verses here. I urge you, first of all, to pray for all people. Ask God to help them, intercede on their behalf, and give thanks for them. Pray this way for kings and all who are in authority so that we can live peaceful and quiet lives marked by godliness and dignity. This is good and pleases God, our Savior, who wants everyone to be saved, to understand the truth. For there is one God, one mediator, who can reconcile God and humanity. 
the man Christ Jesus. He gave his life to purchase freedom for everyone. This is the message God gave to the world at just the right time. And I have been chosen as a preacher and apostle to teach the Gentiles this measure about faith and truth. I'm not exaggerating, just telling the truth. In every place of worship, I want men to pray with holy hands lifted up to God, free from anger and controversy. And I want women to be modest in their appearance. They should wear decent and appropriate clothing and not draw attention to themselves by the way they fix their hair, by wearing gold or pearls or expensive clothes. For women who claim to be devoted to God should make themselves attractive by the good things they do. I believe right here in a nutshell, uh, we find what God's will is. What he desires us to do with our lives. Now when we're thinking about doing things our way and what our will is, it reminded me of a story. Uh, this guy was on a diet. His biggest temptation was donuts. As he drove down the street to work, he passed by a donut shot every morning. And he, and he stopped there just about every morning. And he thought to himself, this morning I'm going to do something different. I'm going to pray. So he prayed, Lord, if you want me to have a donut this morning, let there be a parking place right in front of the bakery. That evening, his wife says, you stop at the donut shop this morning. He said, well, let me tell you what I did. He said, I prayed. I put it in God's hands. He said, God, I pray, God, if you want me to have a donut this morning, I want a parking spot to be right there in front of the donut shop. And he said, in the eighth trip around the parking, around the block, there, anyway, you know where we're going there with that. I spotted it. And sometimes that's the way we are. You know, we want to do what God wants us to do, and we pray that, but then we put those little caveats along with it and kind of define it, tweak it, etc., so that it meets what we really want to do. We say we want to know God's will, but a lot of times what we really want to know too often is how to bend God's will to ours. You know, there's times we pretend that God's will is a great mystery. We don't understand what's going on. We don't know what to do, but in reality, most of the time, our problem is a lack of obedience, not a lack of knowledge. Mark Twain said this about the Bible, and I believe it applies to God's will also. It's not those parts that I don't understand that give me the biggest problem. It's the parts that I do understand. So what's God's will? What does he want us to do? How can we differentiate here between God's will and our will? Well, I believe this passage of Scripture really takes a big chunk of God's will and puts it right there in front of us in plain English, black and white. It's not a mystery. It's not complicated. There's three things here that Paul's pointing out as he's writing to Timothy, that God wants Timothy to do, that God wants all of us to do, three things that are in his will. First of all, God wants everyone to be saved. We notice there in verse 3 and 4, this is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants everyone to be saved and to understand the truth. God's will, God's desire, is salvation of all lost people. Uh, the Christian message isn't about making us healthy, wealthy, or wise. They, those can be byproducts of the gospel. But the gospel is about how men and women who've messed their lives up, who've disobeyed God, can be made, made right with God now and for eternity. Uh, the story we received that Jeff shared with you during the communion meditation, uh, I shared that condensed version during the first service. That's what we're here for as the church. We're here to help people get past their past and recognize that God has a future for them. And that's why we're here, to help them find that path and to stay on that path, to encourage them as they travel that path, because we've all done the exact same thing. Every person here has some type of a past that we're not proud of, every one of us. Some a lot more than others, but we all have that. But God has blanked that out. He's given us a future, a freedom from that. That's what we should be doing as the church. God wants, it's his will, that every person be saved. And that's our opportunity to help with that. It's not about political policy. It's not about political program. It's not about social reform. It's not really about caring for the poor and the hungry. It's not about building hospitals or orphanage. Those are all good things that the church does. And many times we're leading in that area. But the truth is, 
we need to recognize the gospel is about what Jesus did on the cross for us. It's not about what we do for God and for other people. It's about what Jesus did for us. He came to seek and to save the lost. That's how you became saved. Somewhere, sometime, somebody came up and told you their story. Jocelyn Seneca did our devotion this morning for our communion time, and that was the main thrust of what she shared. We all have a story, and we have the opportunity to share that story with others to let them know what God has done for us. Somebody did that for you. Somebody shared their story with you and what God meant to them, and that helps springboard us into where we are right now in our relationship. The gospel is about what Jesus did on the cross for us. Scripture is very clear. Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. Someone shared it, we listened, we accepted, we obeyed, and we're saved. Now, when God says he wants all people to be saved, I believe I can easily say all means all. It's not a selective group. It's not just for rich people, white people, old people, young people. Jesus wants to save the up and out as well as the down and out. He wants to save the person who's only broken one of the Ten Commandments just as much as he wants to save the person who broke all ten of the Ten Commandments. He wants to save respectable people. He even wants to save the type of people that Matthew was talking about last week. Loving our neighbors, even some people where it's hard to love them, God still wants to save them. All means all. This is God's will. But however... It doesn't mean that all people will be saved. Jesus and the Bible make this very clear. You have to recognize that as we share our story, as we recognize God wants all men to be saved, it's not our responsibility for the decision they make. Our responsibility is simply presenting Jesus to them through our story, through our lives that we're going to talk about a little bit more, and then they're going to make the decision. God doesn't play favors. He doesn't say, I'm going to let you in. I'm not going to let you in, things like that. Uh, in Revelation 22, 17, as the Bible is being closed out, the Spirit and the bride say, come. Let anyone who hears this say, come. Let anyone who is thirsty, come. Let anyone who desires to drink freely from the water of life. God's will is truth-based, and God wants all men to be saved, to come to a knowledge of the truth. And it comes from hearing the gospel. That's where we come in. We share our stories. Now, again, if someone doesn't respond, that doesn't mean we give up. We continue to pray for them. We continue to share our stories with others. You know, sometimes talking with some of the kids, my grandkids, when they're playing Little League and stuff like that, and only got two hits this game, Grandpa. I said, well, you're two for four. That's 500%. If you were in the major leagues, you'd make about a bazillion dollars. If you get about that good, you know, it's not about the bad, it's about the good. When I was at Cindy's Church many years ago, there was an individual I got to be very good friends with. His name was Carl Christmas. He and his wife have now gone to be with the Lord, but she came to church and never missed. And Carl was sick. I went to see him in the hospital. We developed this friendship. And uh, I'd go visit Carl. And every time we visited, I'd say, Carl, you know, we'd love to see you in church. And I'd ask him about, he said, oh, I believe the Bible, preacher. Yeah, I believe in God. I, I, yeah, I believe in Jesus, but yeah, I, I'm not ready. A number of years after I had left Spartanburg, I got a phone call from another individual in the church. And he said, I got something to tell you about Carl Christmas. And I thought, oh, my gosh, has he died? Or, you know, what's happened? He said, I knew you and he were rather close. And I said, yeah, I just I prayed for the guy for years. Most frustrating guy I ever met. Didn't disagree with anything I said about the Bible or God, but didn't want to, didn't want to make that commitment. He said, well, I wanted you to know last Sunday Carl was baptized. We don't know when our story might come to fruition, just like we planted a seed, just like we shared that little testimony. That's what we do. God's will is that all are saved, but not all will be because they have free choice. We recognize also, along that line, Paul said, and I have been chosen as a preacher, an apostle to teach the Gentiles this message about faith and truth. I'm not exaggerating, just telling the truth. That's what it's about. We just simply tell the truth. We don't have to 
sometimes some people think that if you don't have some kind of a unbelievable, you know, from the gutter to the pulpit type story, you know what I mean? Some lightning bolt thing. I, I had a person tell me one time, they said, what's your lightning bolt testimony? I said, I had no lightning bolt testimony. I said, I went to Johnson. I said, I had no desire to be a preacher. I said, I was going to go there. I wanted to play basketball. I care less about preaching. I just, I wanted to play college basketball. And I said, through the classes and different things, I thought, you know what? Maybe God wants me to give this a try. And they went, really? That's your story? <laughs> so you don't have to have some unbelievable lightning bolt story. Just share what God's done for you. Just as Paul here said, tell the truth. So God wants all men to be saved. And the second thing we notice here in his will is that God wants those who are saved, you and I, to lead godly lives. Our lives are related to God's desire for all to be saved because we're his best advertisement. Now, right or wrong, this is not an excuse for people, but right or wrong, this is a reality. So don't miss this. It's not an excuse. It doesn't justify anything they're doing. But friends, it is a reality. People make judgments about God based on the conduct of God's children. You know what I'm saying? A lot of times people make their judgments about God, about church, about all these things based on our lives. If they don't see any difference in our lives, why in the world would they want to respond to anything we're saying about God? Now, that doesn't mean we're to live perfect lives. It doesn't, we, we're not going to live perfect. You know, even on our best days, we mess up. But we've got to do our best. That's why in addition to wanting all men to be saved, God wants us to live, as it said there, peaceful, quiet, godly, holy lives. Titus chapter 2 parallels this passage. And it says that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about you. And so that in every way they will make the teaching about God our Savior attractive. And the point is, what God here is saying, I believe in his will, is that our lives should back up our words. It's easy to talk the talk, but we've got to walk the walk. We've got to make sure we're doing our best, even though we're not perfect, even though we're still going to mess up, we've got to do our best to make sure our lives back up what we say we believe. It's this intertwining of the words that we say and the lives that we live. Uh, only the good news about Jesus is going to convert someone, but we have the privilege of sharing that good news and what it did for us. You notice four words there that Paul used to describe this. The first two talk about our relationship with man, peaceful and quiet. We should lay, be the kind of people who get along with other individuals. Um, even if we disagree on something, we keep ourselves under control. We're not troublemakers. We don't look for arguments and quarrels. Uh, we should have a reputation of being kind, of being gracious, of being peace-loving. The second two words deal with our relationship to God, godliness and holiness. This idea of godliness refers to a, a spiritual reverence. It's more than just skin deep. Uh, our love for God is genuine. It permeates uh, through our lives on a daily basis. This idea of holiness is describing a life that's set apart for God, not some holier-than-thou type life, but a life that makes a relationship to God through Jesus Christ a priority in the words that come out of our mouths and the actions and the things that people see us being involved in. Again, God wants all people to be saved. That's number one. Now, that's not going to happen if we don't live lives that back up the gospel. That's why he wants us to live those godly lives. That's his will. But there's a third thing. You notice where he talks about he wants us to pray. Everything within God's will is wrapped up in this package of prayer. Uh, God knows what we need. We need to be in prayer communicating with him. The first of the year, we gave out these little prayer, daily prayer guides. Uh, we had a little theme, who and what are you going to pray for in 2024? I have not asked for a show of hands of how many people are using these or still picking them up. I don't know. They're available back there. But it's just a guide, if you will, 
Uh, every day it asks the same question for you to write down. My daily prayer on, and you put the date. My personal prayer concerns. Praises for answered prayer. Person with whom I'm feeling tension. My question for God. My prayer of faith to trust him. And, and then a scripture to end. They're available. Um, hopefully it just kind of helps us get into this pattern of putting before God our concerns, putting before God someone we're having a problem with to get that resolved, so forth and, and so on along that line. The text we read, did you notice it started out, I urge you, first of all, to pray for all people. God wants all men to be saved. God wants us to live that holy life. And God wants us to pray for everybody without exception, even those people like Matthew was talking about last week, that we don't like all that much, or we don't get along with them all that much. But still, we're supposed to love them, and we're supposed to be praying for them. Prayer is the heart, if you will, of God's plan for saving the lost. We pray for the Lord to send the laborers. We pray for God's plan to respond to Jesus, to open doors, but we've got to be willing to be laborers. We've got to be willing to open those doors. Um, Interesting to me, where it says they're praying for kings and all those in authority, you, you probably remember when Paul was telling Timothy to pray for kings and all those in authority, who was in authority over them at that time? They were under Roman oppression. These were evil, anti-Christian tyrants. But yet Paul said, you pray for those people. You pray for those that are above you. We live right now in a terribly partisan political time. I'm not sure if it's ever been any worse than it is right now. It seems like if you're on this side of the aisle, you've got to do everything you can to criticize and tear down that side. If you're on this side, your main goal is to do everything you can to criticize and tear down the other side. We don't hear a whole lot from anybody about what's going to be done to help our country. All we hear about is the terrible things about the other, two, other individual. Attitudes have certainly hardened in recent years. It seems like Republicans and Democrats are at each other's throats all the time. And sometimes as Christians, if we're not careful, if you're a, a Christian and a Democrat, you think it's your God-given responsibility to tear down the Republican Party. And if you're a Christian Republican, you think it's your God-given responsibility to tear down the Democratic Party. It seems like those are the times we live in. But as followers of Christ, God's will is very plain here, folks. There's no misunderstanding this. He said, you pray, no qualifications, you pray for the kings and the rulers, the presidents, the local people, whoever it is that have authority over you, you pray for them, regardless of political party. Most of you probably know, unless you have headed your head under a rock, uh, this was an assassination attempt on the president last night, President Trump, past President Trump. Just a miraculous thing that he turned his head and it hit his ear instead of the side of his head. It would be a different story today. But one of the things I noticed right off the bat, I got up early this morning just to listen to some more news to get kind of get caught up on it. And I think Cindy thinks I watch too much news, but... Uh, you did too. Okay, good. I'm glad somebody else is here with me. And, and, he, and this guy's wife loves Diet Mountain Dew, becoming my favorite couple. But anyway, <laughs> you're hearing all of these individuals from both sides of the aisle praying for President Trump, for his wife, for his family. That's great. That's great. I'm a little cynical. You know, the first thing I thought of when I heard these words were they praying for him and his family before this happened? I can't make a judgment call on that, but if I were to, I'd say, probably not. Probably not. But God's will is that we pray. And, and why? Why is that his will? The society we're in affects how we live. Let me say that again. The society that we're in affects how we live. And those who govern affect our society. And that's what we live in. So can I make a suggestion here? 
because this is going to blow over very quickly. You remember 9-11? You couldn't find an American flag. I remember Lee and I had a discussion about that. And we both were wondering how quickly that would die off. And there wouldn't be new flags flying, but there would be flags that should be taken down that were torn up. And this national high would quickly ebb, and, and it did. This is going to go away, too. And before long, it's going to be people at each other's throats again over the politics. So let me make a suggestion. When this begins to happen again, and it will, whenever someone who claims to be a Christian, now you listen to me. If the person is not a Christian, you can't do this. Don't try it with a non-Christian. It will not work. But if the person you're talking to that you know is a Christian, and they come up to you, and they start bringing up politics, and they start ranting and raving about one person or the other person in whatever party, say, wait a minute. Have you been praying for that person? They're probably going to give you a really dumb look. But again, you've got to do this with a Christian. You can't do it with a non-Christian. They're going to say, why? But say, have you been praying for that person? And if they say no, then say, let's just stop here for a moment. Let's just pray together. Let's pray for that person. Might change some attitudes. I don't know. But that's the direction we need to go in. That's God's will. That we do that. We pray for everyone, even kings, presidents, those in authority, even those you might not like, because God wants us to do that. So, we pray that we live godly lives. We pray that the door is open and we live that life and share our story. We pray and live and speak of Christ so that men and women around us will come to know Jesus as Lord and Savior, to be saved and share eternity with us. That's God's will, folks. Those three things, that's God's will, that all men be saved, that we live good, godly lives to be a good example to those people, and we pray. So next time you're thinking, what's God's will in this situation? Think of those three things. God wants everyone to be saved. God wants us to live a life that's godly and represents Jesus in a good way, that it permeates out from us, and we pray. There's God's will, folks. Not all that hard to figure out. Maybe not quite as easy to put in an application, but that's his will. Keep that little form in mind as we go forward. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for uh, the privilege of being your children. We thank you for the, the, the privilege, the opportunity of being your ambassadors, of having the opportunity to share what you've done for us with those who need to know you, as we do, as Lord and Savior. No matter who it may be, no matter whether we agree with them or not in a lot of different areas, you love them. You love all. You want all to be saved. Help us, Father, to have that same kind of love and through our lives and through our prayers be representative of that. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's be standing, shall we? Thank you.
Good to see everybody here uh, this morning. Uh, I guess there was some excitement in town Saturday. Is that right, Jeff? He said he had a balloon land right in the cross streets right there, right next to his house. So uh, I guess they were having tough places to land. So um, next year, um, hopefully the uh, Webbers will have a party out their house again. Um, it's open for everybody. Somebody was asking me about that. There's no age limit. We had old people like... Me, Matthew. <laughs> and we had people like the young ones here with little kids and stuff like this. So come next year we have any of the, any of the trine, excuse me, trifocal things. There's really not an age limit. And the next one is August is at Sunday Night's House out at Wall Lake. And we'll be giving you more information on that. And hope you can come and join us. It's always just a good time to fellowship, just to sit around and uh, why are you grinning like that? You've got a thought in your mind. I just, you, you all don't realize what I see when I'm standing up here sometimes. Anyway, you all have a great day.